So my name is Mark Nelson. Uh, I am the EVP of Product Development at Catalo at the moment. And I'm here to talk a little bit about what you should do if you want to build an enterprise SaaS product. Um, so as mentioned, a little bit about my background. Uh, I spent, let's say, forever and a day at Oracle. That's where I grew up as an engineer and spent a great deal of time at the internet trying to help Oracle get to the cloud. I, I spent the last four and a half years. Is this not working? All right, better. Um, I spent the last four and a half years uh, just two blocks down that away uh, at Concur, um, which if you're not familiar with, Concur is the leading SaaS provider of travel and expense software. And then as of six weeks ago, uh, I moved over to Tableau, um, where I'm now EVP of product development, um, and another company that's trying to make the transition from you know, leveraging their great on-premise software to being a great SaaS company. So there's a little bit of lessons learned of you know, what, um, what I, I've learned over the last decade, close to decade, creating SaaS products. And the first is that SaaS is all about the second ass, right? If we're talking about software as a service. This seems like a simple point, but it's really hard. And it's especially really hard for companies that start off selling their software um, and then say, boy, I should be a cloud product. I should be a SaaS product. Because in software as a service, it is all about the second S and all about being a service and not about your software. So you start with this, and that's what you think about. But the reality is, as a SaaS product, this is indistinguishable from this to your users, right? If the best way to provide your service is to have a half million trained monkeys on the other end of the wire, then you should have a half million trained monkeys on the other end of the wire. Because your users don't know the difference. They really don't. Um, and that's something really important to get through your head. Now, for all of us who are software engineers, the good news is that it's really hard to get trained monkeys. So the reality is you still write software for this, right? Obviously, we're all in the business of writing software. But users no longer see your software. All they see is the service that is the result of your software. And that's really important, because what does that mean? It means that the only thing that matters is that service. It is the culmination of that software plus your ability to operationalize it, plus your ability to patch it, keep it up and running, do all of those things. Because if you can't do all of those things, you might as well have not written your software because no one sees it. You don't deliver it to them. So what do you want to do? You want to create an enterprise software product. That means finding some business process that businesses have to do and make it easy. And make it easy in a fundamental way that is hard to do with just software, be it Slack, you know, uh, team communication, be it travel and expense, be it data visualization and analytics. Find some problem that customers have that they need to solve in their business. Find something that is in particular onerous for them to do today because they have to run software. Because the way that this has always been done in the past is some combination of human labor and software that, you're, that businesses have to run on their site and make that magically go away with a half million trained monkeys on the other end of the wire or more likely with software on the other end of the wire. Right? That's what customers want is some big easy button that's going to make some problem that they have just go away. And when you provide this on the cloud, the, the, the ability to do that in an easier way than they've ever seen before with a form factor and adoption rate that they've never seen before will become easier and easier and easier. So easy to say, hard to do, that that's the way you need to rethink what you're doing, right? You are no longer building software. You are now taking some business process, making it super easy, and providing it to your users in a way that they've never consumed it before. That's your challenge when you think about what it means to create a product that is a SaaS product. Um, so there's a couple next I'm going to go into just some of the attributes of what this means and what customers are looking for in, in this world. Um, and the first is that you're no longer just building an application, right? You are now building a system. And it's really important that that system can expand and grow to incorporate code from your users, code from your partners, code from the universe. 
Because when you look at business software, the way business software has always been when it has been on-prem, how did people customize that? They almost always customize it. Well, first of all, it's enterprises. Every enterprise thinks they're a special snowflake, doesn't think that your software is good enough for them because they're a special snowflake, so they need it to work their way, right? For four decades, what have we been doing? We've been selling them software, piling in features, and then even more than that, laying them pile their code, their deployment, their whatever on top of that in their data center. That's exactly what they wanted and exactly what they asked for and exactly what caused them the most pain. <laughs> because that is what makes those products sticky, hard to upgrade, hard to maintain, a giant pain in the ass. So great, so they've drunk the Kool-Aid, they wanna go to SaaS. But those, the push and pull that you're gonna get is those same enterprises are gonna say, yeah, but, but still gotta be a snowflake, right? Like, sure, I wanna do travel and expense in a standard way. Sure, I wanna do analytics in a standard way. Oh, but I'm still a snowflake. And you need to accommodate that to a certain degree, but you don't wanna do it in the way you did in the past, which was letting them embed code into your product, letting them put their own form factor on top of it. This type of platform is the way you do want to enable it, right? Again, you want to let people build on top of whatever it is that the core capability that you're providing, right? So you become the dial tone for something. And that's why people are going to come to you. They're going to come to you for team communication. They're going to come to you for travel and expense. They're going to come to you for analytic capability. But then you have to make sure that they can expand on that. They can make themselves as much of a snowflake as they, they have the appetite to do so. That there's room for partners to come in and solve problems that you're never going to solve, right? That, that people in the past solved by layering on their own bits in their own data center. You want to leave room for that universe to grow around you because it's great for you, it's great for your customers, it's great for the market, right? And you see the super successful SaaS companies have become these centers of their own universes. Salesforce is a prime example. You, you look at that ecosystem of all the, the logos that went up around Slack. You look at what Concur has done. Um, they become the center of the universe of this whole little world that's providing an extremely rich set of functionality to their customers that go well beyond, again, what Salesforce is providing with just CRM. You look at what is now built on the CRM platform and things that are built around that dial tone, and it's amazing. People run their whole companies off of that. Consumer-grade user experience, right? This is the up and increasing bar, and I can say this because I've been in enterprise software for a long time. Enterprise software in general didn't care about user experience and didn't care about its end users. Just didn't. <laughs> because typically you sold into the IT department, you sold into the CIO. If you added value to the business, people bought you. And if it was a shitty experience for the end user, meh, whatever. The company still bought you, they would force their employees to use it, and that was the bar. And that was the bar for a very long time, and that was a, that was a sad place. I'm sure if you've been around the industry for a while, just been an employee that used these, these systems, you have scars and memories of those painful systems. That world is changing very quickly, which is awesome. It's changing for a couple of reasons. One is, as you get to a SaaS model, the beautiful part is you can provide these easy services. You can get adoption from customers super fast. It also means companies can switch super fast. If they don't like you, they get to move on. That means that that lock-in and that bar that used to be, well, I sold the CIO, he was happy, that hence I'm sticky here no matter what the end user experience is, isn't true anymore. That's one factor. The other factor is just the demands of those end users. All your end users are now doing pretty much everything in their online life, right? They're comparing you to these things. And this is a super high bar at back at Concur, right? Travel and expense. This was not some back office function where you could go, oh, well, yeah, user experience sucks for that, but that's the accounting department. They'll get used to it. Travel and expense is something every one of your employees did. They all filed expense reports. Most of them traveled. They knew what it was like to, to book travel on Expedia or on choose your favorite um, uh, travel site, right? They knew how easy that was. When you then have to book travel for business and it's painful and it, and it really stinks, like people know that's not because it's hard. It's not impossible, right? They can go somewhere else and they can see. It's just that you're not trying, right? So that bar is getting pushed continually 
that really people are expecting this out of what they do at work. And user productivity is becoming a real thing that, co that um, companies can demand. And there's competition around this because now this is a differentiator when it's not that sticky to change from one company to another company. This bar is continually going up which I think is awesome. And it doesn't just mean how pretty are the bits. It means everything that these companies do, all the buzzwords that were talked about downstairs, right? It means having this magical experience when you interact with the system where you're only being asked to do the things that you have to do. That the machines, you can throw in big data, ML, AI, your favorite buzzwords of the day. All that really translates down into this is the system should be doing everything it can for you and only asking the human beings to do the things that the human beings have to do. And that's been the user experience demands, like in, it is the lifeblood of these companies, which is why they were on the forefront of this, right? If it wasn't addictive and compelling to use Facebook, you wouldn't use Facebook. And in Facebook's case, you are the product. So if you're not there, they die. That same bar is now being applied to enterprise software, right? It's not their lifeblood, you know, we get paid for our, for our software, but it's still that bar and that experience is now just becoming the expectations. You're expecting it to be as easy to use, you know, whoever read a user manual to get on Twitter? No one did, right? Now, and it's the same expectation, really? I have to go to my online system to, to file an expense report and I have to go read a manual? Who, who does that, right? That's the bar that you're now being held against. Just the ill at ease that you're going to be held against, right? Um, they expect it, just like the rest of the online world, to always be there. To always be there, to always be fast, because that's the way the rest of the internet works. Security and privacy. Like, if you're an enterprise company and you're taking data from enterprises, even more than the consumers, because now you have not only user data, you have company's data, which is like the combination of both. Right? You have the responsibility back to those end employees and their data, as well as the companies that are overlaid on top of it. So twice as much uh, problems. And in the enterprise space, um, you get all of the privacy issues that go along with, again, those consumer sites in a weird and wacky way. Um, how many of you are familiar with GDPR? Love GDPR? Yeah, awesome. Uh, GDPR, you know, again, was something that was made when the, when the legislators made that in mind, it was mainly around consumer services, right? That was kind of the sweet spot that they were aiming at and that privacy. But it's trickled into the enterprise world in a bunch of ways that quite frankly, the world hasn't figured out, right? It's easy enough to say, Facebook, I want you to forget me. Great, Facebook has to forget you. Um, if you're Concur or you're Salesforce, you've been an employee. Concur is the best example here, I think, because you're, you've been an employee, you've filed an expense report, and then you come along, you leave the company and say, I wanna be forgotten. Okay, great, I'll forget you. All right, but for tax purposes, for five more years as a company, I'm legally required to be able to tell you what you did with your expenses. Do I forget that employee? Do I not forget that employee? How much of that employee do I forget? Super vague. It's super wacky world out there right now, but you're expected to play in there if you're gonna be an enterprise SaaS company because this is the legislation that's out there. And again, those rules weren't, rent, weren't written for enterprise companies. Enterprise companies have just happened into it. Um, sorry, let me go. Yeah. Oh, visibility and transparency. This is an important one too. So your consumers are companies, companies who have been running your business problem most likely in their own data center. So when things went wrong, they got to go yell at their IT staff. They had visibility. Now that's gone from them. The upside is hopefully it's much more reliable. You now have to, you get to do this at scale and in a way that will be more reliable for those companies. The downside is when something goes wrong, they don't know what goes wrong unless you tell them. And they get really angry with you when they don't know what's going on, very angry. So it's super important that you are as visible, as transparent, as communicative as you can be, because if you're not, they won't trust you. Okay, so some foundational principles on what you need to do here, right? Um, and this is you know, somewhat engineering 101, but has a new meaning as you get into a SaaS service, right? First and foremost is you have to decompose, right? As soon as your system gets to any size, if you want to run at speed, you have to have pieces that people can operate on with clear boundaries in between them so that you can build it up, right? Otherwise, you end up wrapping yourselves around the axle. This has new meaning in SaaS because, again, no one knows what your software looks like. 
the beauty is you have a lot more degrees of freedom than you did here when you had to deliver software. Because when you had to deliver software, it all had to hang together for the user in terms of how did they install? How did they administer? How did they debug? Good and bad news for you now is as a SaaS provider, that's all on you. So you can do whatever the hell you want. Woo um, that, that as we get to the late in slides, there's an upside and a downside to that. But it is a huge upside is that it gives you new opportunities for how you decide how your teams work um, to provide that best, best solution for your customers. With the second caveat is simplicity always wins. Simplicity always, always, always wins. So if you have 100 teams and you send them in 100 directions and you end up with really big spaghetti craziness, you will find that you will die under the weight of that. Um, so balance those two things and this theme will come up again. Failure is not an option, right? Um, so customers are gonna rely on your service being there. If you're at all successful, you're gonna be seven by 24 around the world because that's where your customers are. Um, and that's all on you and all on your data center and hitting you all the time, right? So they expect you to be up seven by 24 just like the rest of the internet. Um, the rest of the internet. And there are some universal truths that I talk about here. Um, so one is everything fails, every component fails. It'll fail in your data center and Google's data center and Twitter's data center, it always fails. Um, every CPU is gonna fail, every network switch, is, they all have time to live. The trick is to make a system that will stay up despite that, right? Just because every component in, is going to fail doesn't mean that your system has to fail. But you only get that get there if you assume that that truth of the universe is there and plan for that. Another truth is human makes mistakes. That's what humans do. That's what we're, that's what we're here for. Um, and the correlator to that is humans under stress will make even more mistakes because that's what they do too. So the key part of that is if you want your system to be reliable, choose where you use humans. And if in particular in failure situations, if you say humans are going to correct my failures, then they're going to screw it up because that's what humans do. So anything that you really can't stand to fail can't involve humans and especially humans doing repetitive tasks, right? What humans are really, really good at is higher level ordering, reasoning, problem solving, one-off type of tasks, unique things that only human beings can do. If your failure mode is, oh, that happens a thousand times a day and I'm gonna ask a human being to go fix that a thousand times a day, you know what? One, two, three, four times in a thousand, they're gonna screw it up because they're human beings. That's what they do. So don't ask human beings to do those tasks. Don't ask them to do things that you know are gonna happen over and over again because they're gonna fail some amount of time. Learn from every event. First time something happens to you, that's shame on the universe. The second time it happens to you, shame on you, right? Um, and you get the unique chance to really dive in here, especially as a SaaS vendor, because it's all behind the curtain, right? It's all behind the curtain. But this is a discipline that you have to get to. And you know what, what we've used successfully in multiple places, and I know that well, I stole from, from another big Seattle company, um, you know, is this notion of the five whys, if everyone's heard of the five whys, right? Which is when something goes wrong, you have to ask, when you do that RCA, you have to ask at least five times, why did that fail, right? So my system went down. Well, because it, it, there was a hard drive failure on my disk array. All right, well, that's not why your system went down, because we had the universal truth, right? Which was, you knew that was gonna fail, you knew full well. So why did the system go down when something you could predict went down? Well, because you hadn't written your system to, to, to deal with the fact that the file server might go away. Well, why, did, why was that, right? It isn't until you go into the five level deeps of that that you believe you're really gonna understand what really went wrong, right? Because you can go replace that hard drive in your disk array, and that's great. But you know what, it's gonna fail again. That's not the reason that your system failed because that's gonna happen again and again and again. Um, some geekier things, some of which may be, be fairly obvious. Horizontal versus vertical scaling, right? You, you know, vertical scaling is great. And as you grow up, you're gonna do this, right? Because it's much easier to have one database that just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's conceptually easy, it's easy to program to. There's a bunch of goodness there. 
But as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you need increasing amounts of magic software. Um, and trust me, I, I worked for 17 years at Oracle. Oracle has made a living out of giving you magic database software um, that can get really big, right? It's awesome. But it doesn't matter. At this scale, if you're successful as a SaaS company, you're going to get way too big for Oracle to give you that abstraction of a single database and have it be useful for you. Sooner or later, you're going to have to figure out how you scale across instead of scale up. Um, and choosing when and how is super important. Because if you do this too early, you can be out there building great distributed systems when your product doesn't work and you have 10 users. <laughs> If you do it too late, you're going to find out that you have 45 million end users in one database and it doesn't work anymore. Been there, done that. Um, for all my concur friends, we've all been there. Um, so, uh, you know, this is a very delicate balance. You know that you have to have that right level that gives you what you need soon enough, but not too soon. State, this is cut and paste, sorry. Uh, that's not the right title for this slide. State management, super important. Um, and this is not an advertisement for EC2, even though it's got a big EC2 logo on there. Um, it is an advertisement of why EC2 was so successful when it first started and what it forced people to do when you designed for EC2. So the first version of EC2 um, only had stateless disk, right? It only had ephemeral local disk. So when you rebooted an instance or an instance rebooted on you, whether you planned for it or not, the disk went away. And when it came back up, it was whatever was in your AMI was what came back. What that immediately forced you to do was to start thinking about state. And not the easy state. Everyone knows, oh, I have transactional state I need to put into a database. That's pretty straightforward stuff that that you think about in systems design. There's a whole bunch of other state that if you're lazy, you don't think about. Your configuration your logs, your, oh, those temporary files that I wrote to disk, right? Those are all state that really matter to you when you really think about it, but are easy to not think about it, right? Um, the original EC2 model and the reason why EC2 is so successful, I would posit, because right out of the gate, they didn't cater to any of that. They said, screw that. The local disk is going away. That let EC2 as a system be really simple to design. It did mean, however, that if you wanted to use EC2, you had to reprogram, right? This is why for years, basically until boot from EBS came along, you know, traditional apps had a hard time going to EC2 because they didn't work. Everything you wrote to disk was subject to going away, and that wasn't really the way software was designed to, to work. So this model, EC2 now has a bunch of things that let you get away with being much lazier than original. Um, you can decide whether it's a bug or a feature, happy to debate about that. But this model and thinking about everything that is around state is super, super important. Because what you need to get to, again, once you get to scale, is um, automation. Automation, automation, automation. And what will determines automation and the hardest parts of automation is management of that state. But if people haven't heard the, the, the pets, cattle versus pets analogy, anyone heard this one before? So in the old world, your machines were pets, right? They were precious to you because of the state that was there. That's why they were precious to you, because you couldn't imagine that machine going away. So you gave them names, usually cute names. They were super important to you, so you took precious care of them. When they got sick, you carefully nursed them back to health until they were doing what you wanted them to do. And that was a giant pain. They became these center like balls that you had to carry around. What you want are cattle, right? You don't give them names, you give them numbers. You don't nurse them back to health when they get sick, you shoot them and you create new ones, right? Because that's way, way, way easier and it also gives you the ability to do a bunch of things you want to. Once you can do that, once you say, I don't care about the machines, they're not precious for me, I can recreate them like tissue paper, I can now build systems, I can now do rolling upgrades. This is how I, how I accomplish upgrades, this is how I accomplish patching, this is how I deal with failures, once you assume that those things aren't precious to you. Because when they're precious to you, all of those, all of those things are super, super painful. End-to-end um, -end team ownership. So just like you know, dividing into smaller pieces, having your teams understand all aspects of what it takes to run that service is super important. Because again, no one sees your software. When your service is down, no one cares whether that was because you wrote Chrome software or you couldn't test it or because the power went out in your data center or because you couldn't patch it. They don't care. 
all they see is the service. And so if you silo your team so that they only, like if you have developers just go, I write the code and I throw it over the wall and I don't know how it runs in production, that's not my problem, you will run into problems because again, customers don't care about your software. They care about your service. And if you don't have everyone pulling in that same direction of, I know what it takes for, to get from the bits that I wrote all the way until it's running in production and just done humming along seven by 24, the natural laws of how human beings work, if they don't feel accountable for that, they won't be accountable for that. That's the way it works. Um, agile, being agile at scale and being agile in a seven by 24 environment, it all sounds cool, it's hard to do, right? <laughs> Everything that you see just in the books, like it, again, it just gets super hard and you need to think about it and think about how you really run what skills do you really take? What do you really want to be nimble about and what does it take to get there? Um, and then the last slide, like software is somewhat the easy part of this, I will say, um, after leading organizations for the last 10 years, right? Access nodes matter and it's the super fun stuff and it's super geeky to go and talk about it. But at the end of the day, that's really not the hard part. Right? How do, you, how do you get human beings to do all of this? How do you balance the organizational pressures that you're about to see to, again, to do this service, right? You're providing a service. The good news is everything's behind the curtain. You can do whatever you want. The bad news is you can get chaos super easily. You want to empower your teams to run, run as fast as they can, make independent decisions. But you're gonna wake up one day and you're gonna have 100 teams around 100 different directions and not one product that makes sense for your customer anymore. Like that continual tension is super hard. How do you communicate at scale, but just enough, right? Go to the Amazon two pizza box teams. Everyone's following is like, I need to not communicate between my teams. But you do need to communicate between your teams, right? There's like this continual push and pull. You know you wanna run fast, you want them to be independent, but you also want one product that makes sense and is coherent for your users at the end. How do you balance those two? Because you can't do end-wise communication. That's exactly the principle of behind the Amazon two box pizza box team. But you need to communicate enough to keep that consistency. Um, and then just culture, right? Like it is how you look at your employees, how you look at how you build software. And it reflects, it shows in your product, right? Do you really care about your users? Or are you creating cool tech? Or are you, you know, are you the, the mercenary or the, the, the merchant, right? Like are you, um, or the missionary or the merchant, right? Are you creating a product because you believe in it? Or are you creating a product because you believe it's what, it, what you can sell? Um, that, just those things and the way you talk about them in your company will show up in your product. They really will. <laughs> they really, really will. If your main goal is to sell software, your product will look like you're building software to sell it. If you're building software because you believe in it, it will show that it's you're building software that you believe in. Um, and there's great lessons to be learned. Um, so don't feel like you have to go it out there alone, um, but pick and choose what matters to you, what you want your product and your company to look like. Um, and there are some links if you get the slides on some, some materials that I think are great. Um, I've never worked at any of those companies and I don't want the exact culture of any of those companies, but I think there are some great things in there. So anyway, thank you. Um, that's my spiel on how to create a great enterprise SaaS company. I got time for a couple of questions. Go for it. Uh, so uh, I, I love this, this part about the culture at the end because I mean, all the things that you've described, that's, you, you can implement processes and rules and whatever, but you know if, if you don't have buy-in from the team, it, it, that means nothing, right? Yep. Um, could you maybe uh, talk about a few examples of how um, of how Tableau had, uh, culture has evolved since its early days? <laughs> um, probably not. Although there's some people in the room, uh, so I've been at Tableau for exactly six weeks. Oh, okay. Um, so in, I can tell you how the culture has evolved in my entire time there. Um, but I can talk a bit more about uh, Concur or some of the other places I've been. Concur is probably the best one. Um, so in the four and a half years that I was at Concur, for sure, like it had fallen into the trap. And um, I'll say Concur and Tableau are both very similar. They grew super, super fast, right? <laughs> super, super fast and got to a certain point back to the, to the, you know, you wake up one day and you have 45 million end users on a single database. Yeah, 
it happened, um, which is a great sign of success, but it had grown up and fallen into all the traps. It was a very siloed organization, right? I had code writing engineers who threw it over the wall to, to a set of QA engineers who then threw it over the wall to a set of people who had to deploy it, who then eventually threw it over the wall to a set of operators who were supposed to keep this running. And by the time it got to the operations staff, it might as well have been third party code, right? Like the, the loss of information and the loss of sense of responsibility was complete. Um, so we really work, that's why that end-to-end -end team ownership is a huge thing on there, right? Is to go, no, 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 none of this, right? Because I went to one of my early meetings at Concur and had dev and QA and ops all in the same room. I said, so how does this work? And they all threw, drew, threw, drew three different diagrams. And it's like, because it's computer science. The beauty of computer science is it's deterministic and I only have one data center really. And so like, trust me, it runs one exact way. Whether it matches any of those diagrams, I don't know. Um, so that was really, that was the harder bit was like, no, no, like this is all, all of our problems. Like how do we really push on that notion that it is the end to end service? That was the biggest cultural attribute to really kind of drive in, so. Okay, all right, cool. Thank you everyone. Um, uh, M.A. Nelson at Tableau.com if you have questions.